Hello, and welcome to this talk on hydrology and geomorphology. This is the second lecture in a stream ecology course taught at St. Mary's College during the summer of 2020. Hydrology and geomorphology, although this tends to be a group of, of thinking that is often associated with sort of dry, uh, repetitive physical processes, is actually really important for stream ecology. And you uh, don't understand it at your own risk when we look at streams as a whole. So while this may not be the first thing that pops into people's mind as being really important in shaping streams and stream ecology, it is certainly one of the most important and it is critical to grasp. So if you find it interesting, phenomenal. If you don't, I would spend the time uh, learning about it. It really is that important. As per a standard, I'm going to post a guide here right away as we enter the lecture explaining uh, what I expect you to get out of this lecture. I also anticipate that while you are going through this lecture, you are also thinking about the reading that you've already done. So a lot of these are relevant to the reading that you should have already covered. One of the things that we're going to spend a lot of time on in this lecture is how does the surface of the earth change? Why does it change? Hint, it's water uh, in many cases. And how does that relate to our own region? Here, I'm assuming that you're in Maryland, but understand that the processes we're gonna talk about are broader than just Maryland, okay? And then lastly, we're gonna talk about how discharge, which is the amount of water exiting a stream, uh, is, in, is in turn shaped by the stream and shapes the stream itself. All right, so one of the first questions you might ask yourself is why are rocks Right, so this is a strange question to ask. I mentioned before in the earlier lecture that most of the Earth's surface is water. There are in fact rocks everywhere, right? Most of the Earth is a rock. There's a very, very thin layer of water on it. But that thin layer of water produces all sorts of really important things. But before we get into it, we need to ask a question about why there are rocks underneath it. Why isn't the Earth just a big ball of water? Or why isn't it just a big ball of rock? It turns out, if you look at our solar system, it's very easy to find big balls of rock, right? Lots of planets are just rock. It's very rare to find a planet with as much water as we have. In fact, it's so rare uh, that we generally don't know of a place that's as liquid as our own. Now, we are limited. We can only look so far, but at the moment, we don't have a good analog for our own planet. So why do rocks exist? Well, rocks exist because they are cool areas of the earth. Cool in the sense that they're no longer liquid rock. The vast majority of the earth is filled or is contained or was contained uh, with liquid rock, right? And it's really, really, really hot. When you think about uh, the liquid rock around the world that comes to the surface in the form of magma, it's so hot, in fact, right, that it'll melt cars easily, right? This is really hot stuff. But also think about this milk cup here. So when you make hot cocoa, you have this really hot milk, liquid milk. But as the top of the milk begins to cool because it's exposed to air and it cools fastest, the milk on the surface begins to condense into what looks like what we call a skin. And this is literally the same kind of process that is occurring with liquid rock. Liquid rock, as it cools, light materials float to the surface begin to cool down more rapidly than all the other stuff underneath, they form a skin of rock, and the hot, hot material underneath continues to be very, very hot. In the same way that this skin floats on the hot rock, our own rocks float on a bed of hot rocks. So there's a couple things to take away from this. One, we're on a surface that floats around on a bed of liquid rock, right? So that's pretty cool. Two, the stuff that's on top of the surface of the earth tends to be lighter because the hot, heavy stuff is below us. So the light stuff generally is on the surface. And then three, this uh, surface then is gonna change. You can't imagine that the surface would be static. There's all sorts of reasons why it's gonna bounce around, right? You can blow that skin on your hot chocolate around with water, with, uh, sorry, air, uh, but we actually, air is not gonna be sufficient to move uh, large chunks of rock around uh, in the way that we're thinking about with, with plates of material. But uh, there are processes that will move these plates around, and these plates are going to bump into each other frequently. So what actually can happen, right, is that these skins of, of solidified rock can run into each other. And when they do, they can do all sorts of cool stuff. 
What I want you to see below this rock, I'm actually going to use black here because it's dark enough to see. All this area down here, I don't know why it makes these little triangular things, but it does. This is the liquid hot rock. And this portion right here is that thin condensed material that sits on top. Now in this image, they show it as being really thick. But in actuality, it is more like the milk jug where you have a very thin skin on the surface of your hot chocolate and all the rest is nice and hot. When those plates run into each other, they're gonna create changes in the landscape. Here you have a plate that's going underneath and you have a plate that's sitting on top. And as a result of that, as this plate goes underneath, it melts, that material rises up and it makes a string of volcanoes that actually produce more material, right? And so at these areas, you can often have these mountains. And we see that on the surface of the earth. There are a number of major plates all around the world. What is important here that I want you to appreciate uh, as we look at this right now is that we are located right in here. And what you can see is we're not near any of the plate edges. As a result of that, we don't see a lot of activity like this. But if you're near a plate edge, be certain you will see the plates occasionally move and they will create uh, real problems when that happens for the animals that are living on the plants that are living on the surface. So for instance, if you're in California, you're literally feeling plates shifting under your feet. The surface of the earth is moving around underneath you, right? If you are in uh, in the Pacific Ocean, especially in the island nations that's, that are all over the Pacific Ocean, the Ring of Fire, as it's called, you will often feel these effects either directly through volcanic eruptions, right, or through uh, earthquakes themselves. In fact, in some places you can go and see these differences, these different plates running into each other. So here's a person snorkeling closer to Iceland. And over here, this is a literal plate. This is one of those dried, cooled areas. This is a North American side. You can see that there's actually a cleft between them, right, where this person is swimming. And then on this other side, there's the actual Eurasian plate, literally two plates of rock sitting next to each other. They don't, they are not the same thing, right? In the middle, if you could go down far enough, you would meet that very, very hot, magma uh, and rock underneath. Very, very cool stuff when you see it. Look at these beautiful mountains, right? These are the Appalachians. Old, very old mountains now and very, very scenic, right? Rolling landscapes. But that's because of the massive amounts of erosion that have occurred. Streams and rain have weathered and weathered and weathered these rocks. And over the course of millions of years, the rocks have changed, the ones that are exposed and the shape of the landscape has changed. And that has had profound impacts on these streams, okay? So the stream is both changing the landscape and the landscape is changing the stream. And of course, the organisms inside that stream are also going to be changed and will also modify that stream, right? So take a look at all these trees. These, these trees, there's a number of different species here, are modifying the landscape, but they also exist within the landscape. They need this type of landscape in which to live right? They are modifying the stream by providing all sorts of changes to the way that water flows and what enters and exits the stream. But they themselves are also modified by the stream, right? The way that erosion is occurring, the way that uh, rainfall is changing the soils, okay? The, what materials have been exposed in the rock, whether those nutrients are available, right? So there's lots of ways in which these systems are interacting back and forth. And again, I want you to appreciate Yes, we're talking about streams, these are aquatic systems, but understand that aquatic systems and terrestrial systems are deeply linked. And one of the reasons we separate them is because we're trying to understand processes which are unique to each system, and we want to understand the systems. But one of the big reasons we break them apart is because human minds have to understand something within a, a context. And it makes more sense to begin discussing those sort of things in relation to, say, all of the wet stuff and all of the dry stuff over here. As I mentioned before, Maryland used to be quite an active area. Today we call it passive, but in the past it was far more like California. If you had been here, you would have been regularly part of earthquakes. There was a time where the African plate here over here actually was traveling towards us. And as it traveled towards us, uh, and also the North American plate, which has Maryland on it, was traveling towards the African plate. As they traveled towards each other, they ran into each other. And at some point when they did that, they formed this beautiful crumpling zone, right? Here's our mountains right here. 
Ooh, it's doing the little jagged peaks, which is useful because that's that's exactly what it would have been like, very jagged peaks relative. Uh, and you can see that there were probably mountains here at about 300-ish million years ago. And over the course of 100 million years, those mountains were formed. But at some time, the plates started to pull away from each other, right? The forces pushing them towards each other relaxed, and now they've pushed away from each other. And as they pushed away from each other, they create what we call a passive margin. And they opened up the Atlantic Ocean, right? So here's the Atlantic Ocean forming. And you can see these gray rocks here. Those gray rocks were actually pieces of the African plate which got left behind. So in fact, you can go find some of our nearest neighbors for rocks anyway, are located in Africa. If you look at them today, if you were digging down in Maryland. So if you were digging in Maryland and you drilled a well and you were looking at some of the rocks that came out, after you get through all that sand, you would get rocks that are actually most closely associated with the east coast of Africa. And that's really, uh, or the west coast of Africa, I'm sorry. Uh, and that's really very cool, all right? That's a really neat thing uh, that we can see today. This plate, uh, having moved away from each other, mean that Maryland now is a very nice place to live for a variety of reasons, but not least of which because it's nice and quiet. We don't have the activity of earthquakes and volcanoes, and we're not likely to get them. All right. In addition to that, Maryland has been really impacted by something else. In fact, a real impact. Maryland itself is right at the edge of a crater, a big, big crater. And that big crater happened just off of Norfolk and it occurred uh, right at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. And the fact that the crater and the Chesapeake Bay are located together is not coincidental. It turns out that this crater is gonna be important in shaping the Chesapeake Bay. When that, when that large, uh, extraterrestrial body, what we call a bolide, impacted. It impacted right here, right here, you can see. And it created a couple of really beautiful craters. It always, almost always, we get one very large crater and then we get a central crater, okay? And that's a very common pattern. You'll see that when I show you an actual crater site. Now this crater, you'd say, I haven't, I've never seen this. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it turns out this crater has been covered by a lot of material. So to see it, you really need to have some sort of ground scanning material to do so, right? But rest assured, it's easy to detect, okay? And it's so large, right, that whole cities can easily fit inside. Here's a city that's easily fitting inside of just the, out, the very edge of the outside crater, right? And when that crater crashed into the earth right there, he created a focal point. And it created a depression. And all the streams around started to flow down towards that depression. And as a result of that, we got the Chesapeake Bay. So here's a good example of a crater that's not been covered. And one of the reasons it's not been covered in this case is because it's in a landscape with relatively little life, right? Here it is in a desert. So there's not a lot of things covering it up. And there's also not a lot of soil being created to wash into it or to cover over it so you don't see it. So it's very, very easy to detect. And this crater also has that double ring structure. Here's that outside edge, right, right here. And here's that inside edge, okay? Right where the bolide actually impacted. And you can go see this today, this is in Arizona. It's a heck of a drive because it's in the middle of nowhere. But you, know, it's absolutely a, a phenomenal thing and very, very cool. Why you might say then, are craters rare on the surface of the earth? I've seen them all, all over the moon. Why don't we have more on the surface of the earth? Why doesn't this happen more often? Why aren't we just pockmarked with craters? Why am I bringing up this one crater as being really important in the Chesapeake region? And when you look at the moon, it would seem to be the case, right? You look at all this, look at all these craters, craters on craters on craters. There's actually craters in craters in craters, right? I mean, there's craters all over the place, really big ones and also really tiny ones, right? All sorts of cool stuff. Actually, this is not a crater. I've circled in the first case, but let's look at a big crater here. All right, there's a big crater here. Well, craters, as I've already mentioned to you, are get covered over. They get eroded by those same streams that they're going to help to create. Um, they get they get submerged uh, and melted away if plates 
uh, fall underneath another plate. They can get crumpled when plates run into each other. And actually, the surface of the moon is a great example of what happens after you leave something like uh, a, a piece of rock in space for four and a half billion years. It does eventually pick up a lot of craters. The surface of the Earth, one of the reasons we don't see a lot of craters, and a good sign that life is very active on a planet, would be the lack of craters. That's not the only thing that could create a lack of craters, but it does show an active planet, an active planetary surface, and that would at least suggest that life may be part of that. Okay? So that, actually the Earth is pockmarked with craters, but they get eroded and removed from the landscape so quickly we don't have a surface like the moon. So let's return to our very special crater here in the Chesapeake region. When that asteroid impacted and created that crater, all of these, these rivers that surrounded it got funneled down into this little tiny point. And as they did, that stream order drastically increased, right? So all of these rivers are running into each other. There's huge amounts more water coming in in one location. And they created, in a sense, the very Chesapeake Bay we see today. This is not that long ago. The Chesapeake Bay is on the order of a few million years old relative to some of the other things we've been talking about. So this is a relatively young system, but still a very cool one. And again, some of the same processes which you see in your day-to-day -day life are the same processes which are shaping the landscape in front of you. So this is what it sort of looked like at one point. After all these rivers started to run into each other, right? So here's that crater area. That's cool. The ocean was actually very far away uh, from that point, which you might say to yourself, why? Why is the ocean so far away now? Well, you have to keep in mind that the ocean level is not constant, too. And the reason that this crater was able to suck all those rivers in was because there was a period when the water levels were very, very low in the ocean. And a lot of rivers were still running across the landscape at this point. And so they hadn't met the ocean yet. So lots of erosion was still occurring and they could make beautiful channels. And it turned out the Susquehanna River at one point was really the, the heart of the Chesapeake Bay. And at the time, it was just the Susquehanna River. And this occurred in the last ice age when all of that water that covers that we see today that covers large areas that we're associated with ocean was actually stored as glaciers and that covered the land and the, the Susquehanna River actually dumped into the Amazon way over here or so the Amazon into the Atlantic way way over here. And if you look at 3D topography of ocean bottom, you can actually go look at what was the mouth of the Susquehanna River at one time right. And all of this would have been land. It would have taken days if you had been, let's say, on horse or on foot to travel to what we think of as still oceanic area in Maryland, right? Because you would have been going through all upland area. So what are these ice ages I've mentioned? Well, occasionally the world gets very, very cold, very cold. And as it begins to cool, lots of water begins to freeze. That makes sense. But if that water doesn't thaw in the summertime, it can build up, right? It can build up and build up and build up. And then we can have large sections of the earth actually just coated in ice. And when I say ice, I mean miles of ice, literal miles. Like if you stood at the base of one of these glaciers and looked up, it would be thousands of feet to the top, right? Huge sheets of ice, right? That are moving down across the landscape. And one of the things that's really cool about ice is it does in fact move. It's heavy, but because it is often associated with liquid water in and around the edges, right? It's actually sitting on a lubricated surface. So it tends to slide slowly across the landscape. And as it does that, it rips up rock, it rips up soil, it moves everything in front of it like a bulldozer. And this actually occurs, you can watch stop motion cameras of glaciers uh, even on a year-to-year -year basis, and you'll see all the material that glaciers are literally dumping in front of themselves. But if you do this over thousands of years, which is how long ice ages last, you can move parts of whole continents. And so the Appalachian Mountains, as we move, say, south of Maryland, tend to be much more mountainous. If you move north of Maryland, they tend to be far more eroded because they've been under enormous amounts of ice, so they've been crushed, and they've also been eroded just by the physical grinding of the ice away, okay? The weight of ice, when you start to add so much ice that it's literally miles thick, is actually really important. It turns out that it actually can crush rock at that, le that amount of weight. They are actually what's effectively creating a press on top of the rock, and you're crushing the rock. 
and that rock will be compressed potentially for thousands and thousands of years. The other thing that's important is, you can see from this is a, the, our most l recent glacial uh, maxima, that at one time Maryland was right at the edge, right at the edge of this glacial ice sheet. Okay, and so if you were standing at the where the university would eventually be when you were at a glacial maxima, you would easily, and it would be part of your daily life, that you would see ice, snow, and glaciers. And not only that, but the rivers around us would be glacial rivers. And so I wouldn't be teaching you a, a course that would be focused on, say, temperate stream ecology. We'd be talking about polar stream ecology, right? Streams that are frozen for large portions of the year. Streams that have relatively simple food webs. Streams that do not have plants in and around them. Streams that uh, are often filled with a very few number of species. And those species are often things like flies that can, can move very quickly if a stream gets covered or destroyed uh, in the course of a year, right? So these systems change and they will continue to change. So let's talk a little bit about the water we have today. If there was less water, right, at that time, then the ocean would have, the, the, this edge that we see here would have actually been the edge of our continent. But today what you see is all the water is actually located much further inland, right? And it creates a very characteristic pattern that we see in the Chesapeake Bay, which I'm going to show you how that is actually created. And again, provide more evidence uh, that, that, that Maryland's view of the Chesapeake Bay is actually a view of, uh, of the Susquehanna River filled in with ocean water. So if there was less, ocean, less water in the past around Maryland, and the sea levels will fall because it's all being consumed in ice, then there's going to be more land. So Maryland would have been bigger. Hey, we could have added some states on the edge here. Rhode Island wouldn't be so small, right? Pennsylvania really would be pretty landlocked. There would be almost no way to get into Pennsylvania with a boat, large boat. And it would have probably looked something like this, right? This is the fat America, right? All this land would have been exposed. And as a word of warning here, if you're looking at Florida, just be aware that all of this here uh, was ocean bottom at one point and clearly it goes up the ocean levels go up and down so all of this will be ocean bottom again and probably in the near future maybe within maybe within 100 years it depends on the climate change scenario you adopt but that's a really important feature don't look at the landscape and say this doesn't change but look at the landscape and say how has this changed how has that shaped the thing that's in it how has the thing that's in it shaped the landscape all right you can see at one time Florida was literally almost walkable to places like Cuba, right? Very cool stuff. Here is a picture of some of those rivers that have no uh, no beginning now, right? So here's a river that ran out to the edge of that plate. And as those ice sheets retreated, you see they retreated very, very quickly. And that river did not have a chance to erode all of this material here. And so it retreated back across that plain relatively quickly, and left behind what is a river mouth. And if at some time the water level falls far enough, maybe a river will run in it again. But if you look at the bottom of the ocean, you will see old drowned rivers, right? Very, very cool stuff. And that gives you an idea about also how much erosion occurs, right? These are probably on the orders of thousands of years of erosion. And look at how much they took off the landscape in that time. Enormous quantities of material. So when you look at a landscape, one of the things I really want you to start to look for is shapes. And one of the shapes that I'm going to ask you to look for is whether you see a V or a U. Erosion is created uh, in characteristic patterns. If you see this typical V shape that you see over here on the left, this is very characteristics of a stream. Streams, as we've pointed out, tend to be very, very small relative to the landscape. And so they work down through the landscape very, very quickly. And that makes a point at which they're grinding away, which is that fulcrum here. And as they grind away, then you tend to get really steep sides and you get this very beautiful triangular pattern. If, on the other hand, you look at the landscape and you see a beautiful U shape like this, that's because glaciers tend to be wide and broad and they grind the surface, right? They, they grind huge amounts of area. They tend to be big features on the landscape. So very different from the way streams interact with the landscape. And as they grind away, they tend to grind away in valleys and they make very obvious U shapes, okay? And if you take a limnology course, 
and hopefully we'll be able to offer that in the spring and we'll be able to be together so we can go do it. I will be happy to take people to go look at some of these characteristic valleys, right? You don't have to travel that far when you get into parts of Pennsylvania and New York. It's very easy to see these. You can just look out your window and you'll see beautiful U-shaped valleys. And you know, just looking at that, that there was a giant block of ice. And as you look into that valley, you know that the top of the mountain, right, it would have been filled with ice all the way from that at least to the bottom of that valley. So enormous quantities of that. And this here, this U-shape, is going to create a very different pattern for streams to erode into, right? This is a very flat system, so streams are going to want to meander a lot as they go into it. So they're going to twist and turn as they move through it. Whereas a stream in these very, uh, these very tight valleys, right, is going to meander less and is going to tend to be straighter. Again, this is over-exaggerating for a purpose, but streams will be far more meandering, this sort of wiggly back and forth nature in these U-shaped valleys. So the way in which glaciers are going to change the landscape is going to have profound impacts on the way that streams are even going to move across the landscape. So again, a good example of why studying polar streams will be different than studying, say, temperate streams, will be different than, say, studying tropical streams, where tropical streams have never been impacted in, the recent, time, in recent times uh, by things like glaciers. Right? Oh, and I've... I've what I want to do is just get rid of all this for you so you can see it more easily. But let's take a look over here on the left now. On the left, you have that really beautiful V pattern. Look at that coming down, going back up. Really nice V. Over here, look at this beautiful U pattern. Goes down, then back up. Makes a smile. Put a little eye here. Maybe a little eye there. All right. Maybe a nose even. Maybe a little nostril. Working with the net. Okay, we're getting carried away with the faces. But that's a really nice U shape, and this, by comparison, is a nice V shape. So this is a glacial valley on the right, and over here on the left is a, is a standard stream eroding through uh, a soft rock. I also mentioned this that ice is really heavy. And ice is so heavy, in fact, that the land is sort of like a sponge in that it can be compressed. And so if you imagine you put a sponge on top of your kitchen, uh, uh, let's say, well, let's put it in your kitchen sink so that your mom doesn't get mad when there's water all over the place. And you put a cup on that sponge and you start to fill it with ice. What you'll see, of course, is that all that weight is going to slowly compress the sponge. Well, if you did that for, say, many feet into the air, right, because these the thickness of these layers is not much compared to, say, the amount of ice that's on top of it, then you'll get huge amounts of compression. And when you were, if you were to say, lift that cup away from the surface, what you'll find is that that layer will spring back, but it takes time. It takes a, a noticeable amount of time, right? Like you can watch it. Well, in fact, that is what we call rebound. And that's still occurring all over the place. And that means that over time, streams in areas that are affected by glacial ice sheets will actually get steeper because they're being pulled up. Right, the bottom is is staying where it, it's still flowing out to the same location, but the headwaters are moving up and away because they are getting higher and higher because the sheet is relaxing and expanding again. And so places like Michigan that have been under ice for a long time actually have a noticeable rise in elevation. Not noticeable in like, wow, that's a lot bigger. My house is now on top of a hill, but noticeable in the sense that like it's detectable on the order of millimeters to centimeters, right? On the orders of hundreds to thousands of years, right? That's that sponge relaxing, that, that land f opening back up. And so what we can think about when we look at the Chesapeake Bay is it's in response to all of these different things which are affecting it in all sorts of different places. It itself is not seeing rebound per se, but its headwaters are in areas that are experiencing rebound, right? And what the Chesapeake Bay really is, is a drowned river. It was a river that ran, and then as the ocean backfilled into it, it just filled up all of the valley. All of the valley is now filled, right? So large amounts of this valley that were, right? And when the ice returns, then it will dry back out, and it will have that nice beautiful V-shaped with a bunch of ocean material on the bottom of it that will be eroded away back out into the ocean. And you can see that here. Look at all this, this elevation difference, right? And this will happen relatively quickly because when we think about elevation in the order of anything from zero to one meter, 
uh, you can be comfortable in saying that that is very soon uh, to be underwater in, say, the order of hundreds of years, right? It may not seem like a big deal to say zero to a meter. That seems like, or it may be, seem like a big deal to say a meter, changing the sea level rise is a meter. Yeah, but on the order of hundreds of years, from a geological perspective, that's really, really fast, really fast. So that is a relatively recent thing, uh, and that will occur in response to climate change. In addition to that, to convince you that these are exactly what drowned rivers look like, right? If you look at the Chesapeake Bay, it sort of looks like this thing over here on the right. Well, this thing on the right is actually created by drowning a river. What you do is put a giant dam on one end of the river and just let the water not escape. And as it does that, it backfills exactly the same way the ocean would have backfilled all these. And you get these really large, broad patterns, and you get these really finely branched, but enlarged, what we call dendric shapes. Right. Look at these branches. These arms are very noticeable, but they're also they've got lots of big wiggly bits in them. Right. And that's because there's so much water in them. They're so, so filled and they will fill back up as much as is available based on how much water is being retained in, say, a dam or based on, in our case, the height of ocean water. Right. And so that means that the, the Chesapeake Bay, as we see it today, the bay is a relatively new thing on our landscape. It is new in the sense that the streams that made it are gone or at least modified. It is new that in that the streams that are making it today or that are feeding into it today are being modified. And it is new in the sense that it won't be here forever. In fact, it's probably on the order of thousands of years before it changes substantially again. Right. So we need to be thoughtful when we look at these landscapes. Remember how fast they're changing. Remember how these streams are interacting with the surface of the earth. Remember how the air, inner, surface of the earth is changing. All right, so if you got this far, that was a lot of material. Why don't you take a quick break and then come back, get a drink of water. That's what I'm gonna do. Now you're gonna see this slide a lot as we move forward for the next few lectures. And what I've done here is I've highlighted major physical features of streams and I wanna keep reiterating them as we go through them. So we're gonna spend some time today talking about discharge and flow, but we will talk about all these other features. And as we move through them, I will highlight them in red. All right. So again, we're going to talk about discharge and flow today, but we will get to all these. Let's step back again and ask, what is a stream? Right. Well, it, as you know, it does cover a lot of area, right? Streams bring in materials from all over, but actually the water itself is a little tiny component of that. And the vast majority of what is a sort of the, the stream's watershed is actually not filled with water, right? It doesn't actually have much water in it, at least on the surface. There's a lot of water under the ground. Water can move between the areas and that changes through times, right? Streams are always eroding materials from one area. They may be depositing some of that material elsewhere and they're always moving around. The water is always moving downstream, downstream, downstream. It can occasionally be backwashed because of a variety of features, but the pattern is down, down, down. And you don't see that in a lot of other ecosystems where you have a unidirectional flow of material through your system, right? It means that if you lose your place, it's gonna take you a lot of energy to overcome and go back to where you were. It also means that if you want to go down, right, it's very easy. Simultaneously, it will also be a lot harder to go back upstream. So there's gonna be a lot of adaptations that you'll see in the animals to take advantage of this, to take advantage of being able to be dragged downstream if, to lots of new habitat without paying very much energy, but also lots of energy being spent to move back upstream for adults to try to lay eggs high in the watershed so that they can deposit those offspring in areas where they can harness that power, okay? The other thing I wanna keep you thinking about is we think about this as a stream that has escaped, right? But really the way we should think about this is a stream that's using more of its watershed at one time. And in the specific case that we're concerned about using watershed area that we do not want it to use. I do not want it to damage numbers of houses, but I can also not prevent the stream from moving around, right? We can only do so much. We can limit it for some period of time, but at some point our projects will fail and those streams will escape the bounds and they will damage property and land around them. And we have to appreciate that as we look at these streams, they are active, members of our environment 
And although they themselves are not a living thing, right? The stream is not a living thing. It's a, it's an ecosystem. It does behave in some ways like living things, like growing and shrinking and changing. One thing you should get familiar with are graphs that you see here, right? So what are these? What are these types of graphs called? You should have picked this up in your reading. These are called hydrographs. And hydrographs show the height of the stream and over some period of time. On the left is a really good example of a, of a hydrograph over just a few days. So what happened here? Right, what, what happened there? Really classic example. The most likely thing that created that hydrograph, right? The stream went up very, very rapidly. It went from about three feet. I know this is in feet. So this is USGS data, which is produced by the, the United States government. The United States government runs on the English system. Everyone else in the entire world, except for that group, has to use metric because it's a standard system. So you will see when I download data from US sources that it will often be in feet, although it will often have the conversion directly to the metric system because that's how we would report it uh, in scientific publications or elsewhere around the world. What you can see here is that we start around three feet and in the course of probably an hour or less, that jumped up to six and a half feet, right? So the stream, if you had had a stick in the water that was just barely covered at this point here, when you came back in just an hour later, right, you could probably submerge almost your entire body, right, in that water with your arm up in the air and just get the stick uh, above the water line, depending on, or get the stick above the, to get the stick above the water line, I should say. And depending on how high you are, you may have had to stick your arm up more or less, right? So that's a lot of water, a lot of water, right? That's a huge amount of water that's moving around. Even in a very small stream, that'd be a lot of water. But what you can see is that it tails out very, very nicely, right? It makes a nice exponential decay curve on the other end as that water flows downstream. And then it returns to this base flow again. And you can see down here, there's another little bump. So there may have been some very small rain shower that occurred and that created a very small peak. Now, if you zoom out and look at this over the course of years, not only do you see, first of all, that there are patterns here, there's a lot of jagged peaks right here, right? And then it tends to subside for a while and then there's a peak and then these sort of more smaller peaks down here. And then it goes into a very flat area down here. But it actually does this year to year, right? But it's variable, pretty variable. Look at this here. Look at how variable that rainfall is. 2001, clearly a very dry year for this particular location. Compare that to say 1999. Right. Look at the volume of water that must have exited. The volume of water is the area under the curve. Right. Look at all that water that must have come out. And look how hyper variable that was. Most parts of the year it was pretty low. Right. If we took an average, it would be pretty low. But at certain times, it would be ten, almost ten times higher, or more, uh, than it was on average. So your stream would be ten times larger. Right. That's a huge volume difference. And then of course, as you would expect. Right, there are periods where there's very, very low flow. Okay, as this river exits the the or enters high summer and extends into winter, it tends to have very, very low flow. Right, very low flow. Okay, there's only really certain area times when it can pick up water. And this is in California, so this is characteristic of Californian streams. And again, why I warned you that streams are really variable. If you're on the East Coast, what we would tend to see is high flows in the spring, low flows in the summer, high flows in the fall, variable flows in the winter, depending on where you are. Some places very low, some places very erratic, some places more constant. Okay, and that, that depends on whether the streams are icing or whether they get snow or whether it tends to be rain or whether it switches back and forth between those systems. Now let's move away from those images which were uh, more advanced and I did want to show them to you right away because I want you to start to see the data and let's look at a, a idealized version of this now and again if we're going to talk about these things I want you to start to understand what I mean 
uh, when I say things like base flow. I already used that word in the last slide. I should have been careful, but I did use it. And that's the way that when the stream is is running uh, at general on a day to day, right? That's its base flow. Okay. That peak is what we call the storm flow as it's descending from that. That height right here, you may hear it called a flood. That's fine. Yep, we call those floods. That's easy to know. But you may also hear it called a freshet. All right. And I've often seen freshet used more in the literature than flood. Okay. As you move up to reach the flood, you're on what's called the rising limb. And as you come down from the storm flow, you're on what's called the descending limb or the receding recession limb, okay, or, de or descending limb of that uh, graph, all right? There is always a lag time between when the water is entering the system, here this dark blue graph behind it, and when you have these high flows. The, the smaller this lag time is, the more responsive that stream is to that uh, entry water, and the more troublesome that will mean, it will mean that let's say you're living by the edge of a stream and your lag time is very short. It will mean as soon as it starts to rain, that stream's coming right up, right? That's dangerous in a lot of cases. And you'll see that in desert streams. There's very little on the landscape. So as soon as water hits it, it comes up and you get uh, flash floods. Very, very dangerous because you have almost no warning, right? Minutes, minutes to seconds before that the streams start to respond. Uh, in other places, like where we are in Maryland, hours, right? Maybe hours. If you're in a very heavily wetland area, oh, a long time, hours and hours, really maybe even days before you get that peak because those areas are so good at absorbing water. They themselves are like sponges and they just suck it up and then they slowly release it, right? So that lag time is very, very long. It also means that those peaks never usually get that high in those ones, okay? Think about, as we're doing this, uh, what else will change strongly with rain? Okay, and the other one I'm going to throw out here for you to think about uh, in this lecture is what will happen when ice and snow become part of this? Think about how they're going to modify things. Think about how humans are going to modify this type of hydrograph, right? How are they going to change the landscape? Are they going to tend to create less or more lag time? Are they going to create tend to create larger or smaller freshets? Are they going to tend to create longer or shorter recession limbs, right? Are they going to tend to increase or decrease base flow, right? So think about that, and we'll talk about that uh, in class. Here's a good example of one of the things that humans can do. Uh, humans often convert what we call soft edges into hard edges or hard, hard uh, uh, surfaces. Here's a great example. So here in 1990, this is the same place, take a picture at different times. There's a big field. That's what we call a soft edge. Now, a big field can absorb water, but it can't absorb water nearly as well as this forest over here. And so at one point there was forest there, although it's been removed. And as that forest has been removed, right, it was removed because people said, wow, that's great. I'm going to build houses on that. Water will not penetrate through people's houses. That's a good thing. But that also means that all that water that hits a person's house has to go out into the stream faster, right? So the lag time and we call this urbanization, right? Because it's being urbanized. The lag time is going to decrease because water is hitting the surface of the land and it is traveling to the stream much faster. And you can see that this has had profound impacts, right, on this community because these people have spread out. It's also true, look at all this concrete, right? All this concrete in here is changing that as well. All these roads are changing the surface. Every drop of water that hits a road is racing down to the stream in a way that when it hit this, field, it would penetrate in through the soil, would have to drip very slowly through the groundwater out into the stream, probably take hours before it really came up. You had a piece of concrete, it's probably just a few minutes before you're down in the stream, right? Really, really large changes. The other things that are going to change are, th think about it this way, on asphalt, that means there's cars. So this is going to start to pull oil, right, into streams. And you may think, well, cars don't leak that much oil. You're absolutely right. An individual car does not leak very much oil, very, very little, in fact. But every time that a car drives, there is a little bit of oil, right, that gets removed. And nobody changes oil perfectly, and no one ever will. And cars do leak a little bit of oil. And when you multiply that by tens of thousands of cars on tens of thousands of trips, it's a considerable amount, right, of oil that's actually entering into streams. 
So there's things like that. There's also other pollutants that are being added to the stream. Think about the trash you might see in a stream, right? Urbanization increases that. Keep in mind too that houses and concrete and asphalt heat much, much faster than on a forest. And so when water hits those surfaces, it pulls that heat out and it transfers it to the stream. So streams in very urbanized area tend to be very flashy, not in just the flow because they're responding very rapidly to incoming water, but also to things like temperature. And if you live in an area with lots of ice and snow, one of the other things that humans do is they put lots of salt out. I wanna be able to drive my car in the winter. The best way to drive my car is to put salt on the road so that that road stays open, to plow it and to salt it. Well, all that salt, there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands of pounds of salt that gets used in even a small neighborhood every year. That has to go somewhere and that goes right into the stream, right? So it's gonna change the concentration of the salt in the stream. Primarily though, just in the winter, right? Because by the time you get to summer, it's gonna have washed away. Well, even in the spring, it'll, have, it'll all be gone at that point. So every time you go to Home Depot and you see pallets and pallets, and it's not, not just Home Depot, any hardware store, you see pallets and pallets of salt. Keep in mind, all that salt will have to wash off you're not eating it. Uh, and even if you do eat it, when you urinate, that salt is being released into the into your toilet and then it'll be flushed down into a stream somewhere. But all that salt's gonna have to wash across the landscape, right? So that's gonna have profound changes. So there's just some of the ways in which humans change streams. We have to be aware that humans are changing streams, right? This is not to say that humans should not build houses. This is to say that humans should reflect on how they are using their environment because we wanna maximize it. And we want to maximize it because we want humans on the landscape and we want them to live good lives. Now, if you zoom out, right, one of the things I want you to appreciate is the stream, which is that surface water, is a tiny fraction of all the water in the area. The reason you have those lag periods is because most of the water around you is actually groundwater. Here's all that groundwater. It's at varying heights, right? It tends to slope down and towards low points but it can be quite high, right? Look how high this water is relative to water down here, right? So very, very different. When that precipitation happens, it has to penetrate all the way through until it reaches that groundwater. And then it has to travel along this groundwater. That groundwater tends to move much slower than what you get in a stream, right? There's a lot more resistance. Think about all the frictional surfaces. And it can also be pulled out by things like plants, right? They're actually evapor evaporating water out into the air. Right, even before it enters a stream. It's also warming to a degree when it gets near the surface and some of it may evaporate before it ever makes it to the stream and then have to be rained out somewhere else. The stream itself is just a tiny little reflection of what's going on broadly in the watershed. And the way that we can actually go about measuring that is I showed you hydrographs and this is exactly how they're collected. What you do is you create a structure, right? like this one here. The water runs across a known area. The height of that area is reflective of the volume that the water is running across. If you know the volume that the water is running across and you know how fast it's running, you can actually know how much water is exiting, right? So we, we know how much water is coming off right here. All right, so I know how much water is moving through this exact location, surface water. Now there's groundwater all around you that you don't necessarily know about, but I know exactly how much water is running off of at that location. And there are these types of gauges all over the US and all over the world in general. And the ones in the US are run by the USGS and the data are available all the time. You can go onto their website and get live data, right? It updates all the time. You get hour by hour information or minute by minute. And it includes all sorts of cool stuff in there. Sometimes they also collect things like temperature and uh, uh, pH, maybe they do salinity, right? Especially in urban areas. If you don't have that, then you have to do something like this right now. Here is here's a lot of fun. This is this is how you know uh, that you're in you're a field biologist is or a field uh, scientist because you want to go out in the middle of the winter to make sure that you're measuring the the flow of water. And this is what this person is doing actually. So they have a transect right here. You can see their transect tape, and all across that tape they're measuring the flow of water at different points, and they know the height of water at each one of those points. And as a result of that, they can estimate the amount of volume that's passing them at any one moment. Now, this is an estimation. It's not as good as a standard gauge with a weir that we just saw, but it's still very, very useful. Okay, and if you're gonna get estimates of things like stream flow, 
especially if you're going to do it in streams that don't have gauges, this is how you would do it. And if you want to get it year round, well, you better wear your thick winter gloves and you better go out and get ready to drill through some water. That's some ice. You won't be drilling through water. Keep in mind, too, how discharge is going to be heavily modified by the time of year, right? So when we think of streams, we think of them in a temperate area where there can be ice. Sometimes there is, sometimes they're not in Maryland. It tends to be far less ice. But if you move north, and especially if you get into mountainous areas, there's large periods of the year where you have a lot of ice, very, very thick ice. And streams will change very, very abruptly. Right. And so especially in areas that don't get a lot of ice, that when it does freeze, it may have really profound impacts on that stream. And we should think about why ice might have profound impacts on a stream. Com and in comparison, look at, say, a tropical stream that would never, ever, ever have ice. No year would it ever have ice. Right. Think about how that's going to change things like the flow, the base flow of that material. All right. So here's an example of how some of these might change. Right. Here is the discharge of a stream and the probability of that through time based on the, a couple of different of, of groups of years, right? So there's some uh, 02 to 2011, 52 to 61. So that's the oldest. The reds are the newest ones. It tends to be the vast majority of time, right? If you look at this percentage of time, the vast majority of time, so 50% to 100% of the time, right? The vast majority of the time, 50% of the time is here. Streams tend to have very low flow, okay? Occasionally, they have higher flows. And maybe 25% of the time in the case of this, right, they have very high flows. So a quarter, a quarter of the time, they have extremely high flows. Less than 1% of the time, they have enormous flows, right? And that's exactly what you see here. This is just a scaled axis, right? The vast majority of the time, here it's not percentage, but it's in probability. So here, 90% of the time, right, low flow. Below, in this case, 5,000 cubic feet per second. Again, this is relying on USGS data, so it's going to be cubic feet per second. But occasionally, very high flows, right, really, really high flows. So look at this. Most of the time, you're in the order of, let's say, 2,500 cubic feet per second. But occasionally, you might get all the way up to here, almost 40,000 feet per second, OK? 40,000 feet per second. That's enough to move houses, right? That's easy. That's a lot of water. Cubic feet of water, 40,000 cubic feet. Think about that. That's that's almost, that's 40,000 feet long by one foot wide, moving by every second. Huge volumes of water, right? 40,000 feet long, that's miles, miles. That's a lot of water, a lot of water. So very rarely there's huge events, but those huge events are going to have really important impacts, right? Because they're going to cause the most erosion. Most of the time, erosion is going to be pretty limited. When you're down here, erosion is going to be more limited. But in a single event like up here, you might erode more than you do with all of the rest of this for years at a time, right? A single event may cause hundreds of years worth of erosion to occur in a couple of days. And again, we must respect then the power of these streams. The other thing here I want to point out is that there's two curves here. This is a perennial river, right? Look how it's always flowing. Compare that to the dotted line. That dotted line does not always flow. At some parts of the year, it reaches zero, right? Daily discharge. Most of the time, in fact, about 30%, I shouldn't say most of the time, about 30% of the time, ooh, my orange is not coming up as quickly as I would like. That, that river, that ephemeral river, does not flow, right? 30% of the time. So three out of 10 days of the year, you wouldn't find anything in that river. And they're not going to be random. They're going to be associated with very specific times of the year. All right, so that was an introduction to hydrology and geomorphology. We have to do a little bit more, uh, and we need to spend a little more time thinking about how water flows across landscape and how it has created landscape, and we'll do that in the next lecture.